keep behind you, those who protect you. Past lives are learned from elsewhere in the universe. Max 21D performs remote viewing, remote viewing, deactivating chips and codes or programming, raising vibrations and healing this great planet. We are co-creating a better reality. Spirit Radio. Thank you, everyone. This is Max Stewart Show. We're broadcasting from all over the world as we speak. And I want to thank uh, my new CEO, executive producer, and director, Russ. Russie Baby. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Well, anyway, uh, I want to thank also uh, my wife, Nicole, uh, Jennifer Martin. Uh, you, not Q, but you. And he's in London, and uh, I want to thank those people in London for being here tonight. And Vanessa, my sergeant at arms, and my guest, Dane Wigginton. Not yet. Okay, now, uh, I want to express myself that uh, I want to thank everyone that does come to Wolf Spirit Radio. This is the a listener supported station, please donate. That's how we bring everything to you. Uh, just want to tell you that uh, we do all this free of charge because we want to help humanity and bring the truth to you. That's why we do it. So, uh, even I don't get paid for this. Uh, none of the people that are here are getting paid because we love we love humanity. And we do it all the kind of love that we have in our heart, and we're expressing that to all of you. Okay? So uh, that's what's going on. Uh, I have a great guest tonight. His name is Dave Wigginton, and he happens to be a, a geoengineer. Uh, he's got a, a website out there. Nicole, would you want to take, uh, say the website? Uh Whose website? Sorry, I was distracted by the chat. Okay. Okay. Go. You talking about our website? Uh, no, no. Hold on, Jim. Dang. Hold on, Dan. Go ahead, Nicole. You you wrote it all here just a little while oh. ago. No, yeah. I I posted it in the chat. Um, if people want to know, uh, the YouTube is user Dane Wigington W I G I N G T O N. Um, and also geoengineeringwatch.org. And you can find Dane also on Facebook under those same under the same name. Yeah, he's an incredible guest, and I'm glad he's here. He's going to share a lot of things that you probably haven't heard yet. So uh, I don't want to delay this anymore. Uh, I do need to tell you, Dane, that the, we have a break at the hour mark. So. Uh, so I'll let you know, hey, we only have five minutes for that. All right, now, Dane, come on in and uh, say a little bit about yourself and, uh, and uh, tell us uh, what, what you want to talk about that some of the people don't know about, especially chemtrails and stuff like that. Go ahead. Well, grateful for your voice and trying to sound the alarm on the critical climate engineering issue, Max, to you and, and your group. And this is not a, a job I wanted for the last now over 15 years trying to sound the alarm on this issue. I'm focused on this issue because mathematically speaking, it's the greatest and most immediate threat we face short of nuclear cataclysm. Why? Because climate engineering is nothing less than weather warfare because of the toxic elements. It's nothing less than biological warfare. Again, mathematically speaking, it's the single greatest assault on Earth's life support systems in the web of life ever launched by the human race. And the downstream consequences from climate engineering are beyond cataclysmic. They are manifesting by the day. And what I would encourage people to consider with this issue, of all the challenges we face, and they are many, if we have an issue that affects virtually every breath we take and every aspect of the web of life, and it is horrifically dismantling all of the above, 
must we not focus on that issue? And that is the climate engineering issue. So that is why this issue is the priority for our site, geoengineeringwatch.org. Climate engineering is nothing less than the criminally insane power structure playing God with the weather, using it for a weapon around the globe. And we can discuss the various regions where it is and has been used as a weapon. But the bottom line is the consequences of 70 plus years of climate engineering, and most listeners would have no idea this is going on. And this is, we're not talking about weather modification in the sense that people understand it. People have heard of and understand somewhat about weather modification, small single engine propeller driven airplanes with a few flares strapped on the wings. Those programs are simply red herrings. They're designed to make people think that they understand what is going on in our skies, that it's not so significant, and so they ignore the issue. Climate engineering is a completely different animal. We're talking about the stated goal of dispersing 10 to 20 million tons of highly toxic heavy metals into the atmosphere like aluminum, starting with aluminum. And the consequences, again, beyond comprehension. And quite simply, if we don't deal with these programs soon, Max, mathematically speaking, we'll be at the end of the road. I see. But, uh, okay. Let's say that, uh, that what you're saying is true. Uh, so how long before the Earth can clean all that up by itself, if it can be? Well, first I want to state this, that I, I am not in any way insinuating that climate engineering is the only problem we face again. We have been very poor stewards of the planet. There's no arguing that. And the, uh, the list of damaging human activities is too extensive to even begin to cover. But, but that being said, climate engineering, the single greatest assault. In regard to the damage done to the planet, and I know this is something most do not want to hear, but based on all available data, including paleo data from the Earth's history, given the significance of what we have done, we will not know the planet we've known in any time frame that matters. The equilibrium periods for the most comparable paleo events in Earth's history had equilibrium periods of 10 to 20 million years for events that were not as significant as what we face now. That being said, we all know life is incredibly tenacious if given the chance. And that brings us back to climate engineering that is completely derailing the planet's life support systems and effort to respond to the damage done. It can't respond. For, let me give an example of that. We know we put 100 million tons of CO2 in the atmosphere every single day, and, and that's only one greenhouse gas. Methane is a bigger gas, and I'm not talking about farm animals at that point. I'm talking about thawing and releasing methane hydrates in the, in the Arctic and other regions. But if we look at past events in Earth's history, and one – parallel event, or, or one comparable event would be the Pliocene epoch 5.2 million years ago. We had much more CO2 in the atmosphere, but we didn't have a dry, droughted out, burning to the ground, Western North American continent. We had a very lush, thriving uh, boreal forest system because it was raining more because of the warmer temperatures. It was carbon laden rain. The, the planet responded to that. It can't respond right now because of climate engineering. And specifically, if we look at the forest fires themselves, and there's a much more dire aspect of the fires that is directly attributable to climate engineering, absolutely attributable as even being part of an objective with climate engineering. I'll have a full report out on that later this week or next week. But in regard to the forest fires, we can most directly attribute that to climate engineering for many reasons, starting with the toxic elements being used are poisoning soils and root systems, Climate engineering is completely disrupting the hydrological cycle, the rain cycle. It's destroying the ozone layer, which is killing trees and foliage from the top down. It's creating more dry lightning, lightning because these particles are electrically conductive. They're uh, making uh, conditions much more suitable for dry lightning. That creates more fires. And these particles, heavy metal dust, is an incendiary. It coats the foliage, the ground, it coats everything. From every conceivable direction, climate engineering is fueling the catastrophic fire. So uh, in that particular case, we can attribute most of the radical increase in fire frequency and intensity 
we can attribute that majority to climate engineering. Again, that's not to negate other forms of human damage to the planet, but what we need is environmental groups and institutions, spiritual institutions from, from every uh, spiritual tradition. We need them to join this fight. And right now, so many aren't environmental institutions and spiritual tradition institutions are not joining our battle because they're afraid of losing their 501 nonprofit. And I would ask all of them, how much will that nonprofit mean on a planet that doesn't support life? Okay. Uh, somebody put in the chat room here that climate control is a hoax. Well, let's talk about facts. And, and when I hear that from someone without a fact to back it up, that simply means that, it feels much better to believe that this is not going on. When we have film footage of these aircraft up close, nozzles visible, turning a dispersion on and off, that's the end of the argument. We have photographs of the interiors of the planes with pressurized dispersion tanks. We have government documents. We have presidential documents, historical documents from many different arenas. We have 70 years of weather warfare in disputed history. So uh, it's easy to make a statement of denial like that, and maybe denial feels good, but denial won't save us. It's that simple. So all we're asking is people to look at the actual data and not cling to conclusions based on ideology, preconception, and bias. I see. Well, that makes it clear right there. That is, uh, if you look up in the sky, you know, that's, you see it up there all the time. We have yeah. photographs of the nozzles, retrofit nozzles, cut close photographs mounted in the pylons aimed into the engine exhaust jet stream to make this look like, quote, cool condensation. So let's, let's pursue this a bit further, if I may, Max. Go ahead. A condensation trail lie. Perhaps, in many ways, the greatest lie ever perpetrated on populations of the planet. With very few exceptions, this is not condensation we see behind these aircraft. Well, how do we know that? One, again, we have film footage of it being turned on and off. You can't turn condensation on and off. You can't turn the, the jet engines on and off during flight. Two, we know that all commercial carriers and all military tankers are fitted with a high bypass turbofan jet engine. 85 to 90% of the air that passes through that engine is non-combusted non-combusted. It's nearly incapable of making any condensation trail except under the rarest and most extreme circumstances. And, and let's consider what we see in our skies. And this is what got me onto this issue for your listeners that don't know. I have a background in renewable energy. I work for Bechtel Power, the world's largest engineering firm. My home is completely off-grid, was on the cover of the world's largest renewable energy magazine, and I was losing huge amounts of my solar uptake from whatever these jets were emitting that absolutely could not be condensation. So let's consider if we see a researcher in say Antarctica at 70 degree below temperatures and their breath condenses, do you see them walking around and pretty soon there's a giant cloud hanging over them that hangs around all day? Condensation does not do that. This is not condensation we see in the sky. We absolutely know that from, again, the laws of physics, film footage, the type of engines that are on these aircraft. So. For those that convince themselves that um, this isn't going on because perhaps they think those in power wouldn't do that to themselves, they wouldn't do this to the climate, um, how many examples do we need of those in power doing things to themselves? How about detonating 2,000 plus nuclear weapons that has, have decimated our atmosphere as well and contaminated everything on the planet? This is business as usual for those in power. Let me ask you this question. Um, is there anything we can do about it to stop it? Because uh, uh, we're paying taxes for a lot of things. I know they're using our taxes to pay for this. Is there anything we can do on our own to stop these people? Uh, it's the only way we can stop this issue. It will take all of us at a grassroots level to bring this issue to light. That's the purpose of geoengineeringwatch.org to provide data, credible data, 
verifiable data that people can use to wake those around them. And, and, and I would state this again, you can only wake those who are willing to wake up. You can show all the facts in the world to someone who has already made up their mind without the facts, and thus the facts don't really matter much to such people. But it will take all of us to bring this issue to light. How will bringing it to light help to stop it? Fifteen years ago when I started this battle, I could only hear my own voice coming back at me, and maybe a few crickets and frogs. Nobody, nobody would listen. But over those 15 years, much has changed, and an army of the awakened is building rapidly. And that's been a combined effort of all those who have awakened and helping to carry this ball forward. In the course of that time, we have attorneys now who realize they will go down with the ship as well if we don't win this battle. They're helping us. We have some people in the military helping us now. We have agency officials helping us now, people in academia. If we bring this to light and the families of military personnel and others that are involved in these programs realize what their family member is doing, if that family member themselves realize what they're doing, because often they don't, they're compartmentalized, we can stop these programs from the inside out. And we must, there's no, there's no other way forward. We must stop these programs or mathematically speaking, we have no chance of even near-term survival. That's a mathematical fact. And I realize that statement alone will cause many to walk away, roll their eyes, and tell themselves it isn't so. But again, I state that denial won't save us. It won't save us. An example I use often, Max, if you're standing in the freeway, you better off, are you better off facing traffic or turning your back to it and hoping for the best? Uh, that simply doesn't get the job done. So. We, we must allow the planet to respond on its own. We must bring these programs to light and to a halt. We'll have many other challenges to face, even if we win this battle. We'll have many other challenges to face. I mean, we're, we are in completely uncharted territory. And the, uh, again, the gravity of what's unfolding can't be overstated. On regard to weather as a weapon, and I would encourage your listeners who, who don't believe or understand that these programs are real. They're historically documented. Project Popeye in Vietnam is, is one major program that Max, I'm sure you're familiar with, yes? You've heard of Project Popeye probably? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I think, wait. Yeah, he, is, he said yes. He knows, uh, okay. Jennifer, okay. if you wanted to go ahead and unmute, Jennifer had a question. Sure, uh, absolutely. For you. Yeah. Uh, I have a question, Dane. You and I both live in California, which has been under assault for years. We've had six years of manipulated drought. We've had these wildfires that were accelerated with the chemicals being dropped on us for years. Um, some of the beaches on the coast of California are being evacuated. The homes are, are being evacuated uh, at the government's request. It just seems like California is under assault. So are we the first um, targeted domino to fall in this end game? I mean, why are they picking on California? That's a great question. And I would argue data supports that there are a number of objectives being carried out. A presentation I would encourage your listeners to look up. If they simply search on any search engine, engineered drought catastrophe, they'll find uh, presentations I did about five years ago, very pertinent today, just as pertinent today as they were then, titled Engineered Drought Catastrophe, Catastrophe Target California. And clearly, the data absolutely forces us to conclude that whatever the objectives, that what is happening in California, now the whole West Coast, including British Columbia, and the west coast of Europe, Spain, Portugal, for example, is absolutely positively a result, a direct result of climate engineering in regard to the objectives being carried out. Again, there are many. As the population begins to see through the criminality in government, in this country especially, and, and other countries as well, but this country is, is starting to uh, be seen for what our government starting to be seen for what it is. If they're mired in personal struggle, that certainly keeps them from being able to address that issue too. And this is very important in regard to the weather. A climate sacrifice zone, at minimum, the West Coast 
has had to be considered a climate sacrifice zone in that as they're keeping the East Coast, the most populated region of the U.S., cooled down with climate engineering. And we look at the long-term global maps, Jennifer, the, the, um, the most anomalously cooled region in recent years is on the whole planet is the eastern half of the lower 48. Now, how can that be for that long of a span running? It doesn't mean there's not hot spells in between, but taken on an average, there's one blue below, below normal spot on the multi-year maps, and that's the eastern half of the U.S. That's one two hundredth of the Earth's surface area. That's not a picture of the whole globe. But in order to cool the east, they've kept a stationary high-pressure dome over the U.S. west. And that's another aspect of climate engineering we can go into in a moment. The high-pressure creating ionosphere heaters like HARP. These are massively powerful ground-based radio frequency microwave transmitters that can heat the atmosphere and create these high-pressure domes. In the northern hemisphere, those domes spin clockwise like a pulley. And that directs all the moisture up over the top of us. It goes back down to typically in the Gulf, and they'll put a low pressure zone that spins counterclockwise, spin moisture up the East Coast. And I don't know if anybody on the call is on the East Coast. If they are, they've been underneath a lot of rain and a lot of cool in, in, in recent weeks. And this is the weather whiplash scenario where in order to cool some regions, they have to heat others. So that's another aspect of why the West Coast, it's, it's a, a climate sacrifice zone. We have enough data now, and again, this will be in my report, to prove that what's happening in the whole, the whole North American West Coast, including British Columbia, is, is not only directly attributable to climate engineering, but it's much more than just a climate sacrifice zone. zone. There are specific objectives being carried out that involve climate engineering in the fires. And in geoengineeringwatch.org, we now have compiled enough data to prove this point. Our report will cover it in, in more detail. But the bottom line is uh, multi-objectives being carried out, none of them benevolent. This is nothing less than weather warfare. I want to stress that. Nothing less than weather warfare. So um, the West Coast of North America and Europe experiencing similar conditions for similar reasons. Uh, um, Dane, we have a comment question from the chat. Um, I believe that this person is saying, I believe that not just in the sky, if not under our feet also, does the drilling of oil, example crude, help sadly to change the face of the global climate? Yes, in fact it does. It's specifically, um, the, the methane release that happens with all forms of drilling, uh, and most especially with fracking, uh, the methane releases are exponentially higher than what's being reported. Why is methane so important? And we have official sources, by the way, trying to polarize the populations by trying to point at uh, livestock as the single greatest source. That's not the case. Not that the cutting down of forests to raise livestock is not a problem. It's a huge problem. But Thawing and releasing methane is a massive problem, and the methane release from petrocarbon or uh, fossil fuel exploration is immense. And again, why is methane so important? Methane is lighter than air, migrates up into the atmosphere, and over a 10-year time horizon, methane is from 100 to 120 to 130 times more potent than CO2 as a greenhouse gas. It's like covering the planet with a layer of glass. Heat gets in and it does not get out. We are plummeting at this very moment toward a, a scenario titled Venus Syndrome. And that is not a metaphorical term. On the current course, mathematically speaking, without a complete change in direction, this planet will resemble Venus in the geologic blink of an eye. Those that don't believe that will soon. We must change course completely. So um, the, the, I know it was a long answer to that question, but the, the answer is absolutely yes. It is, is, the, is hydrocarbon drilling and production greatly and negatively affecting the climate? The answer is a resounding yes. Thank you. 
Um, well, we can get into anything else you'd like to talk about that's pertinent. If I could go back. Information. Yeah, go ahead. The, the weather warfare scenario, and I mentioned Project Popeye. And again, you can, if you have a question, come along in the meantime, just, you know, just let me know. But um, that's only one example. And now let's take some other examples. We have um, the former NATO, head of NATO, Wesley Clark, one week after 9-11. Your listeners can look this up, by the way, because he's on film stating this. One week after 9-11, he was told which countries would be taken down, taken out, taken over, if you will, in the Middle East. Those were all countries with hydrocarbon reserves. And it is not a coincidence that every single one of those countries has undergone a once in 1,000 year drought that destabilized those countries. And that served the agenda that was uh, Wesley Clark was informed of one week after 9-11. So this is nothing short of weather warfare. We have US, the US military and I believe 150 or 160 countries around the world all data indicates that similar cutting off of precipitation has occurred with many of those countries. In Sub-Saharan Africa, for example, we have a lot of bases in Africa. We have a lot of uh, troops stationed in, in various regions there. And weather has simply been used for weapon for decades. And for those who ask, and some do um, ask, why would they use weather as a weapon? And I would respond with, why wouldn't they use weather as a weapon? We have, I'm not sure if anybody on the, has anybody on the call here or on this broadcast seen the film we have of then Vice President Lyndon Johnson in 1962 ranting and raving like a crazed maniac that we had the power then to control the weather and that he who controls the weather controls the world. Has, has anybody on the call seen that? Yeah, Jennifer is saying she has seen that. Yeah, I would encourage your listeners if they look up, they go to geoengineeringwatch.org and look at any global recent global alert news broadcast under the top story sections. Recent, the very beginning of those broadcasts is a clip of President Johnson, again over a half century ago, stating clearly that we had the power to control the weather, and he who controls the weather controls the world. This equation is not hard to put together. The data is there to back it up. But quite simply, we have an entire power structure and the media they control completely invested in hiding this issue from the population till the last possible moment. Why? Because the liability issue is incalculable. The carnage that has been caused by climate engineering uh, could never be quantified. And I would argue this, once populations around the globe realize that not just our government, but all governments have actively or passively participated. And once their populations realize this to be the case, I would argue we will have a completely different equation. There's a very dangerous tipping point getting up to that, that critical mass of awareness. And that is when governments realize the populations are going to wake up, I would argue they're more dangerous than ever. And they will likely trigger perhaps another false flag event, global conflict. We can speculate, but I, I would doubt that they will walk away quiet, quietly. And once the public realizes this has been done to them without their knowledge or consent, an experiment from which there is no return, I would argue if we reach that point of critical mass, that people around the globe will be taken to the streets with their pitchforks and torches in the attempt to find anyone and everyone involved to hold them legally and morally accountable. And this issue, like no other, holds our fate in the balance. Uh, Dane, I have a question. Is there any um, way to seek sort of a lawsuit or um, anything le legally that we could do, like to sue Monsanto? I mean, I know you did a lot of research on the patents that Monsanto took out um, to uh, create the sprays that uh, they've been spraying with us for years. And um, is there a way, like there's a Geneva, I think there's a genocide treaty of 1988. I don't know if it would apply to them, but is there a, a legal way that we could 
engage a, a, a lawsuit against them for trying to kill humanity? It's a, it's a very important question. We do have a legal team. We have filed a lawsuit in Canada. We are currently suing the U.S. Department of Commerce. Why the U.S. Department of Commerce? Because they're the overseeing agency for NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. NOAA was not releasing our legal team's FOIA requests, Freedom of Information Act requests. In fact, it's, it's quite perplexing what NOAA did. They, they, their first response was to say they don't know about any weather modification anywhere ever. And consider what a patent, patently absurd statement that was, what a blatant lie, when they're required to sign off on several hundred local and regional weather modification programs every single year. That was their first response. So once we sued, sued the Department of Commerce, we are getting some Freedom of Information Act requests returned now. But we also must consider that there is currently an illegal federal gag order on all National Weather Service and all NOAA employees. Gagging the weathermen. Now, why would anyone gag the weathermen if there wasn't something very big to hide? You, and your listeners can look this up, by the way. If they search anything they want to search along these subject lines, if they search geoengineeringwatch.org, uh, illegal gag order weathermen, or geoengineeringwatch.org, uh, fires, or geoengineeringwatch.org, geoengineering destroying the ozone layer, they can find articles. We have about 2,500 on our site. So the bottom line in regard to lawsuits, we're pursuing that. Canadian government doing everything they can to slow progress. Same with our suit here. The system, especially in the U.S., has been systematically set up for decades to make it extremely difficult to bring this issue to light. We are doing our best to navigate through that system and to bring a credible suit to light. And it must be a solid suit because if we go to court, without having a completely watertight ship, if you will, and that is for any little technicality booted out, that would do our cause far more harm than good. We must be prepared. We're doing our best to get to that point. But in the meantime, what matters most and what our legal effort is about, we will never, I want to be clear, we will never stop this issue from purely legal uh, lawsuit means. It, it has to be a critical mass of awareness of people within the system refusing to participate because they will play the national security card at some point and that would shut us down. But it's about disclosure right now. And that's the bottom line. We reach a critical mass of awareness. We can stop this issue. We'll stop it from the inside out. And, and that's what our lawsuit is designed to do to bring awareness to this issue that it's real, it's credible, and it's an existential threat for all of us. So we're, again, we're working on this and, and also to point out the legal issue we have, Documents, for example, one is a, a congressional document that's almost 800 pages long. Your listeners can look at that at geoengineeringwatch.org in its entirety, or they can look at the excerpts we've pulled out, important excerpts to keep people from having to go through the whole thing. Uh, and again, same thing, they can search geoengineeringwatch.org, Senate document, they'll find it. But in that document, it calls for blanket legal immunity for anyone and everyone involved in these programs. Now, why would they need blanket legal immunity if there wasn't something very harmful going on? Just like the vaccine manufacturers, blanket immunity. How hard is that to figure out? Something very criminal is going on. So um, we don't have much time. I want to I stress that. I, based on available frontline data, based on the level of crop failure happening around the globe, fisheries collapse happening all over the globe, the skyrocketing UV radiation on the surface of the planet, by the way, we can most directly attribute that to climate engineering as well. Even though nuclear detonations and other forms of human activity, every rocket launch, all damage the ozone layer, single greatest damaging factor is climate engineering. So if we take even, for example, that one issue alone, ozone collapse, if we had no other challenges, that one factor alone is a global extinction event in the very near term horizon. We are getting extraordinarily high levels of UVB on the surface now. In some cases, hundreds of percentile points above what we're being told. And we're getting UVC on the surface now. That's the last band of UV radiation before x-ray. I think we know all, we all know how damaging x-ray is. We are not being told. It's killing trees, killing foliage, killing insects, killing plankton. And it's killing us. 
And the, the former NASA engineer that we had working with us, he was a contract engineer, we furnished him with equipment. And his conclusion, at the current rate of ozone loss, we had perhaps till 2025 until total ozone collapse. Game over. Game over at that point. And that doesn't mean it stays normal until that point. And that's only that one issue. That's not counting anything else that's going on on the planet right now related to climate engineering and other factors. So the greatness of our situation, again, can't be overstated. And at the same time, I want to stress to listeners, and we can go into this more later in the program, we are not helpless in this equation, but we must get off the bench, learn how to be effective at raising awareness, credible awareness. We must all become involved in this scenario. There are other scientists, of course, um, sounding the alarm along with you. I was listening to an interview with Lorraine Murray. She's a scientist out of Berkeley. Quite a mind. Is she? Oh, she's great. I met her at a peace dinner a couple years ago with some of the students uh, in the Pacers for Peace Club. But uh, anyway, she said that if you spend an hour outside in the sun right now, you will get cancer. That's, that's what she said. It's, it's getting about that bad. I, I respect her as well. She's, um, I know, done her best to sound the alarm. And again, this is the stunning example of the insanity going on in our planet right now. So from the logic of the climate engineers, with our militaries really at the head of the coordination of these programs, in their mind, with their justification, they have to spray more and more and more reflective materials to try to mitigate the damage done from their activities in the first place. Does that make sense? It doesn't make sense, but if you understand the scenario, you understand what I'm saying. It's doing more of what they're doing to try to mitigate the damage done from what they were doing to begin with. Does that make sense? It makes sense. I need, I need to ask you a question. Um, okay. All these uh, chemtrails that are being dropped on us, they're doing, and uh, this is very unlawful what they're doing, okay? So my question is, if they're doing something illegal, and the, uh, I only know about a couple ways how to take care of this little problem, but uh, uh, I don't want to incriminate myself, but... Uh, I just want to say, because uh, there's a couple people out there in Tennessee that got these big uh, 50 calibers that can shoot very far, even way up high up there where they're at. And uh, they've asked me this question. Uh, they said, Max, can we use our weapons and knock these planes down? He says, I can't answer that. Because uh, if you shoot one of these planes down, you will end up uh, killing everybody in the pilot and, and that plane, and then that plane could land where there's civilians and they could get hurt too. So um, they asked me that question, I asked you that. My answer would be this, the moment that anyone goes down that road, we have lost. We cannot go down that road. Yeah. There's no, there no violent way that, that must not be a part of this equation in this. And let me finish with this. We can only win this battle with the U.S., enough of the U.S. military on our side. Without them on our side, we have no chance, no chance. And the moment somebody crosses the line, like what you just described, that's, that will be exactly what those in power want, exactly the excuse they need to galvanize military against their own citizens, that is exactly the wrong thing to contemplate. We, we can only win this battle from the inside out, only by reaching a critical mass of awareness, and everyone can play a massive part in that. And, and let me, if I can go over that for a moment, on the, the Kim Trails term itself, that's a term we definitely want to avoid when we're trying to communicate this issue to people who are unaware of it, to media people, to agency people. It's okay with a conversation amongst ourselves, but we have to stick to the science terms. We're, we're playing chess, we need to play it well. Semantics matter. That term, because it has no basis in science, is immediately used to marginalize our issue. And let me give an example of that. In Arizona, 
there was a meeting of citizens on, quote, Kim trails. That was a mistake they made using that term. They invited Arizona Senator Kelly Ward to that meeting. And as soon as people in government found out she was even listening to this issue, they labeled her Kim Trails Kelly and completely marginalized her. Now, if Senator Ward had gone to a geoengineering meeting, would they have called her geoengineering Kelly? No, that wouldn't have happened. So the bottom line is semantics matter, using the science terms matter, and this is more important as well, passing on credible data, visual data, that is compelling. That's so much more effective than anything we can communicate verbally. Uh, Max, I think you've seen some of our printed materials. Is that correct? I think, Jennifer, you have too, right? Yes. Uh -huh. So if you had a chance to use those, I hope you've discovered that it's, it's certainly, as opposed to trying to just verbally communicate this message, it's way more effective to hand somebody something that they can see the photographs, see the NASA satellite images, see the photos of the nozzle, see the document copies, for example, a copy of the, the federal gag order on all National Weather Service and no employees, it's much more compelling for people. And we put those links on our website, those downloadable links. So one, you can share those links from your own home computer with anybody for free. Or you can take those links and print your own copies. The links are free. Again, we make printed copies available at the approximate cost of our, our production on, at very high levels of printing and our shipping we're just trying to get them out there we, you know if you try to print some of these materials in smaller quantities they're they're quite expensive because they're colored glossy high quality materials but we make them available at our approximate cost of production and shipping or we make the links available free and, and sharing those links free from a person's home computer can do an immense amount of good if you ship it to groups organizations and individuals express that this is an urgent issue that we all must take part in in exposing uh, can do an immense amount of good. And given all that's happening in the environment right now, the implosion that's happening on all fronts, even people who thought they could ignore all of this are realizing they can't. They need to get involved. And uh, giving them the right dots to connect can be immensely important. Uh, Jane, tell people about how to get your brochure that's on your website. Uh, the links are right there in the top upper left corner. And again, you can click that whole link open and read everything at home, share that PDF link with anybody, but it's right there on the home page. And we, we put a tremendous amount of materials in our package uh, for the price. Again, it's, this, is, this is not about any sort of profit for us. It's about uh, getting this issue to the light of day while it still matters. So, so all that's definitely on the home site. And again, credibility is key. We have to stand on building block facts that we can back up. And those facts are plenty scary enough. We don't need to venture off of speculation or, or conjecture. And it's important, again, for, for people to understand the whole system of forecasting, for example, is controlled from the top down and from the climate engineers. All the weather modeling is done for National Weather Service and NOAA, it's done by Raytheon, private defense contractor Raytheon, geoengineering patent holder Raytheon, primary geoengineering participant, and they do the modeling all the way down to the local meteorologist level because in our, in our NOAA documents we just got from our lawsuit and our Freedom of Information Act prove this, that those in the top levels of government want consistency over accuracy with the forecast. So the local meteorologists are literally reading a script given to them ultimately by Raytheon. And that's how they know, for example, sometimes a week in advance that a particular day is going to be quote, mostly sunny, which almost without exception means no natural clouds in the sky, only the spreading, lingering, sprayed aerosol dispersions from climate engineering jet aircraft. So the, the scope of this cancer is immense. And it, it's, again, it's important for listeners to understand that the military industrial complex, for many reasons, 
has participated in these programs. Ultimately, it's about power and control. But a primary objective is to mask the severity of damage done to the climate, to mask the immediacy of what's closing in on us from all sides, biosphere implosion, and thus to pacify the public until the last possible moment, to keep them divided and confused in regard to the true state of the climate until the last possible moment. And uh, if you guys want me to go over another aspect of how they do that, it's, it's a process called, a patented process called chemical ice nucleation for weather modification. Has anybody heard me discuss that issue on the call? Yes. So, and that process, if you're listeners, what does that mean? Chemical ice nucleation for weather modification. When they have enough moisture available to them, they can create a frozen precipitation event out of what should have been a liquid precipitation event. They can create snowstorms. Thus, we have snow falling on the pyramids in the United Arab, United Arab Emirates where it's never fallen before. Uh, we have weather whiplash scenarios going from, in some cases, literally, we, we've seen temperatures go from 100 degree all-time record high in the ground to snow in a day. It happened in Amarillo, Texas, May 1st, 2013. And these events are very confusing to the population that don't know climate engineering is going on. So it convinces many of them, how could there be global warming when it snowed on the pyramids? Yeah, it was 50 degrees maybe when it started snowing, but nobody talks about that. So with chemical ice nucleation elements sprayed into cloud moisture, that causes an endothermic energy absorbing reaction that can begin the freezing process. It creates a, a cold, dense layer of air that descends to the ground, lowers temperatures on the ground eventually, and again, can create frozen precipitation out of what should have been liquid precipitation. Um, guys, you've, you've seen all the massive hail falling. Has everybody seen and taken note of the massive hailstorms? Yeah. So this is indicative of chemical ice nucleation. It starts that nucleation process again very early on. The hail gets very big very quickly, um, and you, you get devastating hailstorms. Um, what about the ice balls in Lake Michigan? Anybody seen those? Max, I'm not sure. I've even seen no. videos, Dane, of people trying to light these um, snowballs on, on fire. <laughs> I mean, they, they light them on fire. There's so much, whatever is in the snow and the, uh, in the water um, is like plastic or something. <laughs> okay, what happens is this. Um, these materials, because it creates an artificial nucleation, it, it tends to sublimate like dry ice. A chemical ice like dry ice which means sublimation means it transforms from a solid to a gas and bypasses the liquid phase that's why you don't get a lot of runoff off of heavily nucleated material um, it behaves very very differently than a naturally nucleated snow and it sublimates so on the ice balls in Lake Michigan your listeners can look this up and we have people sometimes that ring in and say I've lived here 20 years we've seen it for 20 years maybe you have Climate engineering has been going on for over 70 years. The first chemical ice nucleation patent we know of is 68 years old. So people who think because they've seen this for a couple of decades that it must be normal, it's not normal. And here's what we saw even last winter in Lake Michigan. 75 pound perfectly spherical ice boulders covering shorelines in parts of the lake when the lake water was between 40 and 45 degrees. Well, how does that happen? Chemical ice nucleation. They're doing the same thing in the polar regions to mask the fact that the, the poles are imploding. There's a lot of ice in Antarctica. That's not going to go away overnight. But we are perilously close to what's called a BOE in the Arctic, a blue ocean event. That means an end to summer ice in the Arctic. It should have happened this year. If it doesn't happen this year, there's a direct correlation to the forest fires and climate engineering. And people would wonder, how, what do the forest fires have to do with this situation of climate engineering? They have a lot to do with it. 
Again, our report will cover that more thoroughly, but we are perilously close to a blue ocean event in the Arctic and they're using chemical ice nucleation to freeze the sea surface at temperatures it should not freeze at. We saw last winter also in Boston Harbor. Lots of photographs of this online that was frozen and slush waves and so forth with ocean temperatures that were about 40 degrees. Ocean water does not freeze to about 28.4 degrees. It takes a much lower temperature to freeze ocean water. Why aren't meteorologists asking what's going on? Because it's a very, very bad career decision for them and they know it. So they're all towing the line for their paychecks and pensions well, the planet's life support systems in order to serve the power structure, and not just of our country, but other countries, planet's life support systems are being systematically shredded. We cannot continue on this course. We cannot. We will not. There's no question about that. So we have a choice. We can get involved, understand that we are not helpless, understand that those in power are not invincible. They can only do what they do because we have a very complacent, compliant public that must change and in regard to the the funds i know uh, max you mentioned because the dollar has been the global reserve currency both central bankers have historically been able to print whatever they wanted for whatever they wanted but that's changing now as well as other countries disconnect from the dollar because they've had enough they have had enough of the u.s empire's behavior and again for those in the military Many are waking up to this as well. I just did an interview with a two-star U.S. Air Force Major General that I posted about a week ago. Did anybody happen to hear that? No, wait. So his name is General Rich Rolick. It took a lot of courage for him to speak out. 30, about 35 years in the U.S. Air Force. And he's still coming to grips with the fact that everything he believed, was taught, was told, with some exceptions, is, it w were lies. And I realize for those patriotic individuals that refuse to want to believe this, um, they might turn two blind eyes and walk away. But I, I want to state this, that uh, blind patriotism is the last vestige of a tyrant. It's not patriotism at all. And although I have great regard for our military veterans, like yourself, Max, who did what they did for honorable motives, I have great regard and respect for that. But that being said, we must remember the oath military members take to defend our country from all threats, foreign and domestic. It cannot be forgotten. And we have so little time to change course. We, we must we must be willing to stand and face the truth head on. I happen to agree with it 100%. Uh, even though when, when uh, I was in, in war in uh, uh, Grenada, um, Somalia, and Desert Storm, um, we all knew uh, my unit, the 1st Battalion of the Special Forces, that's unit, uh, we all knew that we were here for the wrong reason. And uh, I, uh, I didn't, you know, some of them talked about walking out, but you can't do that. We're sent here. This is domestic. I mean, not domestic, but foreign. And we were there for the wrong reason, for sure. It's all it was about oil. That's all it was. And other resources. But anyway, what I wanted to say is that um, we always go to war for the wrong reason, and uh, and the public is misinformed about the truth. They they always uh, say that we got attacked or we did this or they did this to us. That's not true. We always uh, not us, but the uh, the the people in charge of the military the Joint Chief and uh, President back in that day, uh, they always did something for their own reason to uh, uh, take control of what they have in front of them without letting the public know the truth. So the, the citizens of the United States, like you said, that 
well, the United States is really a corporation, and very, very, very little we're working into the Republic of the United States. Uh, and uh, a lot of this is going to, uh, I, I think there, there's going to be a big surprise coming very soon, that when the public knows about what's really going on, they're going to get hysterical, and they're going to start doing something about it. I just don't want them to go, like you said earlier, uh, not to do anything uh, against the law, to do it the right way with going to courts and, and suing the, uh, the different parts of the government that are involved in this. Um, do you think that our president, Donald Trump, knows about this stuff? Uh, there is no question. On that particular point, I'll answer, and then I'll back up on a couple things if I may. In January of 2016, Trump's top campaign people and Carson's attended a meeting at a U.S. Air Force Major General home, not the one I mentioned earlier. This is a second U.S. Air Force Major General, General Charles Jones, and they were given our data, geoengineeringwatch.org data, informing them completely about the climate engineering issue. So there is no question they know what's happened since the Trump administration has taken office. Climate engineering has gotten far worse. And so it's not that any administration hasn't done the same. They've all done the same. It's simply now worse than ever because the biosphere collapse is worse than ever. So there's absolutely no question that the current administration, like all previous administrations, absolutely positively knows about this issue and is doubling down on it. All administrations have no different now. I'm back. Oh, I was going to answer also, uh, I don't know if you had anything else to add to that, Max, but you mentioned false flags and everything you stated, I, I salute you for giving your military service. I salute you for uh, being willing to call these issues exactly like they are. And I fully agree with you when you stated as people begin to wake up, they will likely, uh, do something, those in power will do something like a false flag. Uh, certainly, I would agree. And in regard to the military conquest going on around the globe for resources, as you also correctly stated, yes, let's consider the catalyzing event, the false flag event of 9-11 that was clearly used for that purpose. And for those who are still blindly believing the official narrative on 9-11, I challenge you to examine the data from 3,000, over 3,000 architects and engineers, top experts in their field from around the globe, that are all part of the 9-11 Architects and Engineers Group, examine that and then consider how completely absurd the official narrative is. It's utterly impossible, completely impossible, that those buildings fell down from a car carbon fire. And, and Max, you know there was a third building that fell on 9-11, I'm sure, right? Yeah. So for listeners to look that up and understand, you know, how can a 47-story steel structure high-rise, I'm not diverting from the climate engineering issue, I want to weave this in, that a 47-story steel structure high-rise fell down at free fall speed in seven seconds, never got hit by anything. It's from some furniture burning on the first story, we're told. But if that's the case, whenever someone lights up a cigarette in a high-rise, we should run for the exits. So 9-11 was the catalyzing issue to get the American public to blindly support the military conquest in other countries, which involved climate engineering, which involved cutting off their precipitation, which was a quest for the resources needed to continue to keep these climate engineering planes in the air and to keep the rest of the military industrial complex machine moving. So bottom line is all of these events are connected, completely intertwined. They're inseparable. All of this is part and parcel of the same. And, and in, in summarizing all this, this, the degree to which the train is off the rails can't be overstated. It absolutely can't be overstated. Okay. Uh, Dane, we're going into uh, a, a five-minute break right now. We're at the half point of the segment. So uh, if you just hang on there, we'll be right back in about five minutes. You got it. Stay, uh, thank you, everyone. Stay tuned. Take it away, Russ. Okay, everyone, take a break. We're off the air for now. 
So you got to go to pee pee break. This is the right time. <laughs> uh, what is this? Uh, for, for the people who wants free Z light. Okay. Uh, that's a good idea. Rusty baby. I love Russ so much. I know he can't hear me, but he, I'm glad he can't hear me. I was going to say something, but I'm not going to say it. I like Russ too much. But I'm getting the same thing he's getting up here in it, that he has on his head right here. I wish he wouldn't do that top view when he's doing his show. Look at that. What do you see up there? I see a bird nest. There's nothing wrong with that. No, it's not. I got one too. And I cover it up with my hair, all this hair I got up here. <laughs> uh, Nicole, you're so beautiful. Do you still want me to ask that question? Yeah, go ahead. It, it was a comment question. It's interesting because I'd never heard anybody relate um, a spiritual experience that could be possibly linked to chemtrailing or... Um, weather engineering well do i got a big surprise for them yeah wait till i get some more of those octorium box in europe new zealand and australia god it's probably, it's driving me crazy these people they all uh, want them yeah uh i'll have yours ready uh jennifer okay good uh very soon uh, i got three of them i got about four here that i'm almost done with it but I can't, I can only do one at a time. Yeah. And, and I'm having a lot of problems with my hands, my fingers, uh, with the uh, two batteries. Uh, hold on a second. We need to send some healing for Max because today he informed me that he's giving up on his finger and he might have to amputate it. But I'm, I want him to try to save it. But Yeah. I'm tired of it. We need to send some serious healing for Max's yeah, finger. Or else, I, I'm tired. Or else he's getting ready to get rid of it. So. Oh, no. Yeah. Yes. Archangel Raphael will help you. Well, send, send them to me because uh, look, at it. it's, look at how swell it is. I mean, it's covered up. And but it's so red, too, underneath oh. still. I, I'm getting tired. I'm just going to tell take it off, and that's it. The only problem is that I see if they take it off, it's going to take a long time to heal like this, like it is now. Yeah. So I will hang on. I will tell the doctor. Yeah, hang on. Hang on a little bit longer and let this thing work out. Right. I'm getting tired of having my finger like this. It should have been healed a long time ago. Huh. I, I had a mute thing. Cause, but anyway, um... Oh, okay. Uh, I got to tell uh, Vanessa, are you listening? Vanessa, I need you to, uh, to talk to me a moment. She might be away from the computer. Don't, oh, there she is. Yes, so I'm listening. Vanessa, I was told yesterday that Sean Catone is. Um, how do I put it? Uh, he, uh, what word will you use that, Nicole? He is, uh, his wife told me. Welcome to okay, yeah, we're coming back. Okay, and, all right. Make sure you unmute, Dan. What? Okay. I I have said all this for nothing. I, I, I had the recording off. My God. I'm recording again. All right. Okay. We'll just I thought going. I pushed it. <laughs> anyway, if you feel that there's a couple minutes short in this recording, 
blame Max because he screwed up again. All right. So at least I, I talk. I say I say the truth about it. Now, Dane, I want you to blow people's mind on this show because as soon as this show is over. I am putting this on Facebook, on uh, YouTube, and BitChute, B-I-T, B-I-T, C-H-U-T-E. It's another thing for YouTube, okay? So, listen, all right, don't hold anything back, Dane. This is your chance to put it way out there beyond, what would you call that? The Twilight Zone. Well, I appreciate that, Max, and I, you know, I definitely will do my best to convey the direness of this issue. And I, at the same time, welcome for anybody in your chat room or anybody that has yeah, a question. We do, we do have a comment and question from the chat here from uh, one of our moderators, Scottish Sovereign. Uh, something interesting, uh, part comment, part question. They say, on a serious note, I believe I had a spiritual experience a few years ago, and chemtrails uh, was part of it, as far as I'm concerned. I was eventually diagnosed with two, yes, two heartbeats, but it's a long story. Is the guest aware of the list of ailments that can be observed because of geochemical-induced death spring? Barium is in the mix. We know that from lab tests from all over the, the planet. And it has quite profound implications for the, the cardiovascular system for the heart specifically. So uh, given this toxic brew of metals, uh, it's certainly causing a, an endless list of uh, human diseases and ailments. In fact, in regard to the metals that we know are in this mix, aluminum, barium, strontium, manganese, lead, copper, uh, polymer fibers. In the case of metals, most people know aluminum is extremely harmful. Most people know mercury is extremely harmful. There's a condition called synergistic toxicity when these metals are combined. We all have mercury in us from multiple sources, the burning of coal, from amalgam of fillings, uh, other sources. We all now have aluminum in us, all of us. There's copious quantities in the air column. We are all breathing it with every breath. And, and when you combine those two metals specifically, peer-reviewed study proves total toxicity can increase by as much as 10,000%, a hundred times worse. So the list of human health effects is endless. So um, you know, I, I, I could not obviously comment on any specific condition. You can take a 50-year chain smoker that died of cancer. You can't prove that the smoking killed him, but the bottom line is we know there's a connection, so there's, there's a lot there. In regard to also our health effects, the radio frequency transmissions. I mentioned earlier in the broadcast the heart facility. It's high-frequency active rural research program in Alaska. Many people have heard of and or seen the heart facility. But that facility is only one of perhaps 100 such facilities around the globe. We also have, for everybody who's seen the constantly springing up cell towers all over, it's not just 5G. It was happening before 5G. 5G, by the way, is extremely dangerous for all of us. But the towers themselves, even before the 5G rollout, are being used for climate manipulation. How do we know that? Because we can see the effect on precipitation radar. We know that many of the, what people perceive to be cell towers are being served with 10 times more power than they need for cell phone transmission. We know those facilities, again, are being used. They show up on the, on the maps. The radio frequency transmissions, the microwave transmissions from these such facilities are used to manipulate the atmospheric particulates to cause them to repel in every direction. It helps disperse and scatter them. And you can see these patterns in the sky. You see these herringbone patterns, perfectly aligned cloud formations that look like you know, the, the fabled herringbone pattern. These are radio frequency transmissions that are used to manipulate these particles. And these transmissions are very, very harmful to us as well. I mentioned earlier in the program the methane that is thawing and releasing from tundra, from the seabed, uh, we just had another incident, and I, I believe Southern California, we had the rotten egg smell 
floating in off the ocean. That's a very telltale sign of a seabed deposit of methane that's thawing and releasing. Hydrogen sulfide comes out with it. That's the rotten egg smell. Hydrogen sulfide heavier than air floats in the surface and um, floats into areas where people can breathe it. It's very harmful. The signs are everywhere of a planet that's in unimaginable change, complete meltdown, and back to the, again, the harm done by radio frequency transmissions. If this methane, which is lighter than air, unlike hydrogen sulfide, methane migrates to the upper atmosphere. It appears as if two projects with acronyms Project Lucy and Project Alamo, those are, that's yet another layer of climate engineering insanity in which they're using opposing frequencies, microwave radio frequency transmissions in the atmosphere, blasting, microwaving the atmosphere to try to degrade some of the methane that's building up there with unknown consequences again. So the whole climate engineering equation is like one layer of insanity heaped on another, on top of another, on top of another. How far can this go? How far can this go? And, and in an attempt to, to program people to accept these skies that are clearly wrong with grid patterns one day, nothing the next, silvery white skies, how much blue sky do any of us see anymore? Even on commercials where you'd expect they would try to find a blue sky, they can't. I know some commercial TV producers, they can't find a blue sky. So all we see now is these dingy, dirty skies. And they're actually, in, they're putting jet aerosol sprayed geoengineering dispersion trails into kids' films. They're in kids' animated films to further program the population to thinking this is normal. The Disney film Over the Hedge, the, the, the animated film Cars, there's backgrounds of sprayed skies. That's how insidious all of this is. There's NASA programs to teach kids that these harmful chemical trails are harmless to them. How twisted and insidious can this equation become? What will it take to wake people up? Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, then you've got people like Al Roker who are looking at these herringbone patterns uh, of clouds and saying, oh, we have a new cloud formation. I mean, they're just out and out lying. Thank you for mentioning Al Roker. What, what, what an example of an honorless criminal coward that's participating in the climate engineering cover-up and should be held legally and morally accountable. And I saw Al Roker one morning doing exactly what you're describing. He had a photograph of a grid pattern, geoengineering aerosol sprayed sky, a grid pattern. And while laughing, he said, isn't nature incredible? I mean, at, at that point, we were living in a totally Orwellian circus of insanity. That's where we're at. And people like Al Roker absolutely should be held accountable. And back to, again, back to what we can do. And, and back to Max, what you stated correctly before the break, that peacefully, lawfully, what we can do. People need to organize in their given region. And, for example, whatever their local media station is, we have one in Northern California, it's called KRCR, ABC Channel 7 affiliate. And we know those meteorologists are reading scripts. They won't address the public on this issue. And we're we are going to organize a massive stand-in, peaceful, lawful, but a stand-in, hopefully with a thousand or more people, to stay there in that parking lot until they cover this issue objectively. Because our local media in Northern California has told us this, and this is an ABC affiliate, we will never cover the climate engineering issue ever. What kind of media is that exactly? And are not those people, I asked this question, if those people knew about some other form of crime, and not that it's any less dangerous than this crime, and they were not forthright in disclosing that crime, that makes them accomplices in that crime. And that's exactly what we have. And people need to understand the severity of this issue. These, these are programs of planetary omnicide, nothing less. We are fighting for our lives. Organizing, and every individual needs to help with this. We, 
there doesn't need to be. In fact, it is more cumbersome to try to have any kind of central organization. We need to independently organize in our regions, figure out who is part of this cover-up, starting with media, and peacefully organize stand-ins to force media outlets to objectively cover the climate engineering issue. We do not have time on our side. Again, it's, it's, it's up to us to organize this. Let me, if I can give a couple of statistics as far as how severe a situation is. In the last 40 years, human populations have doubled. Global wildlife populations have declined by nearly two thirds. Insect populations. We were the first, to my knowledge, at geoengineeringwatch.org to publish a little less than a decade ago that insect populations in Northern California, terrestrial and aquatic, had crashed nearly 80%. We now have peer reviewed study to back that up from Europe. 80% decline in insect populations. How long do any of us think we'll be here when the insects can't make it and they're not making it? Bees, pollinators, we know we won't make it without the pollinators. We have told the beekeepers for about a decade that there was a, a very significant heavy metal contamination issue, that that was a bigger issue than the glyphosate contamination or even the radio frequency signals. They haven't listened. They're still not listening. Whether they're being subsidized uh, to keep them going, we're not certain, but we now have peer-reviewed study. If your listeners search bees aluminum, they will find peer-reviewed study to prove that the bees are dying of massive aluminum contamination that are giving the bees symptoms that resemble Alzheimer's and dementia in a human being. And these are bees from some very remote places. This is affecting all of us, absolutely all of us. We are getting dumber by the day. And I don't say that facetiously. That's a statistical fact. IQs are dropping precipitously. How can they not? How can we continue to fire on all neurons when we're inhaling toxic heavy metals with every breath that we know from internationally recognized experts like Dr. Russell Blaylock, internationally recognized neuroscientist, stating on the record how dangerous these climate engineering operations are that the inhaled heavy metals, very tiny particulates, in fact, climate engineering uses nanoparticulates, unimaginably small particles, which air quality doesn't test for. That's why they go under the radar. And these nanoparticulates are inhaled. They enter through our olfactory nerve and our nasal passages, go straight into our bloodstream, cross the blood-brain barrier, where they begin to build up on our systems and our brains. This is reality. It's happening. Some are more susceptible than others, but that's why... Alzheimer's and other neurodegenerative diseases are absolutely epidemic. This is a fight for life. And on the extinction rates, overall extinction rates today, some larger institutions are beginning to report what we have reported at Geoengineering Watch for nearly a decade. Extinction rates today, two to 300 species of plant, animal, and or insect, two to 300 a day are going extinct. That's 15,000 times the background rate. That's a million and a half percent of normal. Think about that. We are free falling into the sixth great mass extinction on our planet. Again, I state this with mathematical certainty. On the current course, we will not be here much longer. None of us. The bottom line is we have to change direction. This has to be a priority. We have to put down the shiny gadgets the cell phones, whatever other material pursuit there's occupying our time and attention. We have to look past the political theater. Can't stress that enough either. The scripted political theater, I don't care what side of the political fence anybody's on, doesn't matter. It's all theater designed to distract us from what's going on around us until the last possible moment. But we have to come together. We have to expose this issue or we won't be here long. Okay. Uh, uh, first, I, let me uh, uh, say a few things there. Don't mean to interrupt you. Um, I want to thank Scottish Severance. Uh, he's from the uh, People for People's Radio. Uh, that he'll be putting this on his on his radio station. So he's the recording right now. Also, uh, I want to I want to ask. Uh, uh, a question: Do you know? Do you know what frequency is that they're using for this 
type of device. Which type of device, Max? The uh, the cell t the cell phone towers. I know well, they're I, I know they're not cell phones. For any given installation, we can't know specifically. When we know we know the larger installations like Hark, they're using a, a VLF and ELF frequencies, very low and extra low frequencies. So there's various bandwidths that they operate on, but the uh, the VLF and ELF frequencies are in those bandwidths. So when we transition to 5G, again, a frequency that's used for crowd control, uh, that should be a very big red flag for people to understand. We are reaching some end games here. Uh, 5G is certainly a sign of the power structure about ready to clamp down in a way that few can yet imagine. Um, people should be literally peacefully standing around and protesting anywhere, any anytime anybody tries to put up a 5G anything, the frequencies are killing all of us. They're killing trees. So there's there's period of study to prove that the frequencies are harmful to even trees. Of course they're harmful to us. Um, we're helping to exterminate ourselves at this point by simply sitting the bench and letting this happen, all of it. Okay. Um Okay, anybody that can hear me here uh, in the chat room or here, and then we'll, we'll spare the chat room and the chat room here. I want you to look up for me and direct it back here to the station here, our chat room here, uh, what uh, frequency is to control uh, crowds and uh, stuff like that. I need to find out that because I'm going to work on something as soon as I find out on that. I know how to do things. Okay, uh, and I don't want to say too much, but I, I went to MIT for nine months, and I went there for a reason. And when they found that I was leaving, they couldn't understand that why. But I have my reasons. Okay, so here's this: I want somebody out there to find out what controls crowds on frequency. I want to know the frequency. So anybody out there is listening to what I'm saying, go ahead and do it now. I need your help, and then I'll take care of the rest. Now, uh, d uh, Dane, does the uh, the Vatican have their hands on this? Well, I think available data indicates that all such institutions at the top of the food chain, if you will, are somehow connected to this web of, this cancerous web that runs the planet. I mean, clearly we see crimes being overlooked from that particular arena uh, that many are aware of, but uh, they're certainly only a part of the equation. And we have, because of the 501 nonprofit provisions, we have uh, spiritual institutions of, of many colors, all ignoring this issue. And uh, that's simply inexcusable. And if you're a member of such a congregation where you're, your leader, your pastor is ignoring this issue. It's up to you, the congregation, to hold him accountable. If he's more worried about losing his 501c3 nonprofit than he is telling the truth and he is being a good steward of the planet, he's not worthy to stand at that pulpit. That's simple. So it's, it's up to congregations to hold their leaders accountable. Same with environmental groups, which I, I have to say I'm completely disillusioned and, and further disgusted with. And I'm an environmentalist to the core. I believe we have a responsibility to be good stewards of this planet. And the behavior from the environmental groups has been astounding. Those groups who, who fault so much of the population for ignoring the planetary meltdown, and then at the same time, they themselves ignoring the single greatest climate disrupting factor of all, climate engineering. More than enough denial and hypocrisy to go around on every side of the fence, every side of the fence, more than enough. And this, this has to change and we have, statistically speaking, again, we have no chance on the current course. And by the way, statistically, the planet is currently warming at the thermal energy equivalent rate of four to five Hiroshima bomb detonations per second. 
maybe some think I misquoted that. I did not. The rate at which the planet is heating right now is the thermal energy equivalent of four to five Hiroshima bombs per second, about 400,000 per day. Please look it up. Please don't believe me. Where's all this heat going? Much of it has gone into the oceans. For the record, for your listeners, if they don't know or haven't thought of this, a cubic meter of seawater can hold 4,000 times the thermal energy of a cubic meter of air. Put an empty pot on the stove, turn the heat on underneath it, see how fast it heats up. You put a pot full of cold water there, it takes a long time. But once that heat is there, it's a tremendous amount of heat. And that's the equation we face. The oceans are, in fact, superheating and dying right now. Oceans die, we die. Plankton dies, we die, part of the oceans. Trees die, we die. Insects die, we die. Ozone layer collapses, we die. Uh, all of these are converging at once. Our situation is great, but I, but I, I do want to stress again to your listeners, we are not... We are not helpless. And anybody listening, any, any one of the individuals in your audience could be a final grain of sand that tilts the scale in the right direction. Any one of them could be. It's up to all of us to help reach this critical mass of awareness, which is the only way forward. The only way forward. Once we expose this issue, our paradigm will shift. I'm not saying our challenges are over, but we will have taken a quantum leap in the right direction. Go ahead, Jennifer. Unmute yourself. Oh, you're on. You're still muted. Here we go. Can you hear me? Uh, Dane, uh, you talked about the nanotechnology and that we're breathing in these nanoparticles. Uh, is there any way to free ourselves of these toxins? Uh, people talk about zeolite and, and other products that um, can attract the heavy metals out of our system, but do you know of anything else that we could um, use to kind of, you know, protect ourselves a little bit? Certainly, there's there's a lot of effective chelators that are actually good supplements anyway. Vitamin C uh, can help chelate, calcium can help chelate. These are essential elements anyway. Um, so there is a lot we can do and we should do, we must do, if we have any desire to stay as healthy as possible uh, while we try to weather this, this storm. So I would instruct people to go to their local health food store. Usually there's a nutritionist there or available. Uh, chelation protocol is something to be taken seriously. Um, you can't do it too quickly or you can cause even more problems because again, these metals are bioaccumulated. They build up in your system. You don't want to free them all up at once. As many may know, if you want to get mercury fillings taken out of your mouth, you have to do it correctly or you'll do more harm than good. So chelation is something, again, to be taken seriously, but it should be done. This metal is building up in all of us, building up in the entire web of life. The bioavailability of these materials is immense. They're so small, they're absorbed into everything. Everything we eat in our water systems, our water supplies, um, this is nothing more than, again, planetary programs of omnicide. And, and to consider how disconnected from reality the whole climate science community is, as all of them, all over the world, the whole climate science community is discussing geoengineering as if it's not going on already, pretending that we still have this card to play, which has been played 70 years ago with cataclysmic effects, and discussing in the case of David Keith from Harvard, world's most recognized geoengineer, dumping 20 million tons of aluminum nanoparticulates into the atmosphere annually, and never once does any climate scientist ever mention, oh, by the way, all of that's going to come back down to Earth where we all get to breathe it. No one even mentions that giant elephant in the room. So. Uh, we, we are truly living in, in dark days, in the uh, betrayal, academia's betrayal of the human race and the entire web of life is truly criminal at this point. If there's any other questions, I'd be happy to take those on or I can 
continue with a few aspects that we haven't hit on yet. Well, I was going to ask about new diseases like Morgellons, and is there anything else that um, is suddenly coming to attack us because of the spraying and the change in environment? Well, certainly Morgellons appears to be the body's attempt to expel foreign materials out of it. And uh, there's different aspects of that particular ailment, which certainly appears to be very real and, and spreading rapidly. We also have epidemic fungal infections, including within the human body. In the environment, the fungal proliferation is immense. Many know that if you take antibiotics and you kill off beneficial bacteria in the human body, fungal infections are triggered and can expand rapidly. The same is true in the environment. So when we have these toxic metals saturating soils and waters, kill, killing beneficial organisms, the fungal proliferation explodes. So we see that in, in trees, plants. Um, it's absolutely epidemic. In the human body, to give an indication of how disconnected and off base much of mainstream media is, the ear, nose, throat specialists, Western medicine, licensed physicians are completely disconnected from reality in their attempt to treat the chronic upper and lower respiratory infections that are now epidemic. And they're treating them with antibiotics. We have more awake and aware institutions like the Mayo Clinic stating on the record that 90 to 95% of all upper and lower respiratory infections are fungal, not bacterial, which means that the antibiotics that are being prescribed are exactly the wrong thing to do. Worsening the situation, not improving it. So uh, truly, the, the worship of physicians, the worship of science, the god of technology, if you will, is, is part of what has brought us to this dark place that we now find ourselves in. It's a sad state, no question. And I... As we watch the hurricane that's approaching Hawaii, so your listeners understand this, there is, we've had hurricane suppression programs for at least 70 years. Projects, Project Cirrus in 1947, that's the first hurricane manipulation programs. How much progress have they made in over 70 years? So, or nearly 70 years, excuse me, 60 plus years. So it's, no, that's 70 years, I'm sorry, it is 70. So we know that they can steer cyclones. So we record this at Geoengineering Watch, uh, Hurricane Harvey, Irma. We recorded the microwave transmissions that were manipulating those storms. It's not that nature needs those storms created. The ocean temperatures are bathwater hot. It's they're astoundingly warm. Nature can spawn cyclones and would be spawning more if not for the particulate saturation in the atmosphere, which suppresses convection, which suppresses cyclones. They have the ability to knock out cyclones any time they want. They are steering them. As we saw with Harvey and Marie, they would migrate for great distances at a lesser intensity and were allowed to spin up before they made impact. And we can, again, speculate on the various motives or agendas or objectives being carried out by steering those cyclones where they were doing the damage they did. But what is certain is that steering of those storms occurred. Absolute certainty. It's important for listeners to understand that. These situations are not nature. The spawning of the storms may be, but the steering of the storms is not. We had another question from Scottish Sovereign here. Um, question for the guest. If we are responsible, um, if that's what the guest is suggesting, uh, for the warming of the big rock, then are we also held accountable for the warming of every other planetary body within our solar system? Well, to start with, there's no credible science data that states every other body in our solar system is warming. There's that hypothesis and that and that conjecture, but there's no science data to back that up, virtually none. In regard to the current changes on our planet, statistically speaking, and I don't speak in terms of my opinion, 
because unless my opinion is backed up by data or statistics, it has no relevance. So right. what I would encourage people is to go on data and not opinion. So back to the current changes on our planet, statistically, mathematically, they are occurring 170 times faster than any previous paleo event. The notion that we could do what we've done to our planet, including climate engineering, and not affect the temperature on this planet is simply not rational. That I would equate that to, if you, an example I've used in the past, if you throw somebody off the top of a building and then claim they died of a heart attack, you're gonna have a hard time keeping that argument or, or making that argument believable to anybody. We have a direct cause and effect here happening on the planet. And for example, there's a rumor or disinformation that there's no warming, that the planet is in fact cooling. There is no source anywhere with any credibility to back that up. We've just passed, I believe, the 404th consecutive month of above normal global temperatures. And we know, because we monitor on the ground, that they are not only not over-reporting temperatures, they are radically under-reporting temperatures, radically. Four, five, sometimes seven, eight degrees. What's that mean? It means it's far hotter than we've been told. So the, the narrative that the entire solar system is warming is absolutely not backed up by any credible science source anywhere. All right. I would like you to get into some of the meat and potatoes that you wanted to get into. Um, if you want to just go ahead and let her rip, just go for it. Well, I certainly welcome questions because I don't know what... Um, yeah, the questions have, have died down a little right. bit right now, so we'll just let you go into um, anything significant that you would like to uh, go into now. Well, again, the bottom line is, for those listening, um, all of us wish that the situation wasn't what it is. But does that absolve us of having to do our part to try to change course? And uh, Jennifer, you're still there online, right? Yeah, she's still here. Yeah. Okay. Okay, well, for both you guys, I, do we not have an obligation, not, not just an option, but an obligation to do everything we can to try to provide some sort of future for our children, those of us especially who have children, do we not owe our lives to our children? That's a Absolutely. reasonable argument, isn't it? Absolutely. So I would argue for those that are busy pursuing their own personal pleasures, especially those with children, we don't have that right. The moment we had children, especially, we don't own our lives anymore. We owe them to our children. And for those that have had, and all of us have, whether we remember them or recognize them or not, we've all had situations happen to us that could have taken us out of the equation, right? That intersection we perhaps ran through that if there was a car coming would have taken us out of the game. We've all had things happen that, um, could have ended our life at that moment. If, and anybody who has had and recognized such an occurrence and, and realizes that we're on bonus time, does that not obligate us to give back to the whole as well? And, and you guys certainly are familiar with the term is better to give than to receive, correct? Correct. How many people feel that in regard to nature? How many? We live in societies that are conditioned to take and take and take and take. And how long can we take? How long can we possibly continue to take? And we're about to find out the hard way. Uh, that time is about over. Nature is unimaginably resilient. We have, we have assaulted the web of life to a degree that can scarcely be comprehended. And it's interesting that many who would claim to subscribe to that term never gave it a second thought when it came to nature. Nature has historically provided 75% of all global GDP for free. No more. No more. Think about this. We, we now have to farm fish in the oceans. 
we have to perform so many things in a manner. We may be pollinating our own plants soon if we hope to survive. And all these things that nature carried out for us for free were engineering the skies with how much some of these aircraft burn a gallon a second, a gallon a second. And for every gallon of fuel they burn, for every pound of fuel they burn at altitude produces about 20 pounds of CO2. That's not a very good equation, is it? So we're living in a manner that's so incredibly counterproductive that is causing us to have to run faster and faster and faster to just stay still. How long can that continue? It's always seemed absurd to me, this whole construct of industrialized, militarized society. Dana, I have a question for you. Yes. If you were in charge of the planet right now, and we, we all elected you the president of the earth, <laughs> what would be the steps you would take immediately? What would you address? What would you change? Those are difficult steps. But yeah. I would shut down... And, and, and I realize this leads to carnage. You know, there's no way around it in the short term, but it's the only way we have of preserving anything. If the human race wanted to survive, if the human race had any interest in surviving, industrialized, militarized society would have to be, other than the absolute essentials, would have to be shut down. And the human race, the mission of the human race would be to plant trees. And literally, as, as fringe as that may be to some people, it's perhaps the only chance we have of surviving short of some unforeseen factor or force. I stated no trees, no people. We've lost an ideal with statistics, so I want your listeners to understand that I'm not offering my opinion, I'm offering verifiable statistics. We've lost 55% of our trees that existed before the dawn of civilization. The other 45% is dead and dying. And those, conservative, those figures are conservative. The forests are no longer a carbon sink. They're no longer absorbing carbon. They're no longer feeding. They're stomata. The respiratory ports are closed because of the intense UV, the intense dryness, the toxic materials. So forests don't smell like forests anymore. They don't. I live in the middle of a forest. I know about this. And my father was an arborist. I spent my life around trees and in the forest. So... The forest is just hanging on in some places, dying very rapidly. But the forest has become a carbon source again. Doesn't expel oxygen. Global oxygen content is plummeting. We've lost about 60% of Earth's plankton populations. That's the primary oxygen producer on the planet. Secondary largest producer, boreal forests. Again, dying by the day. Oxygen percentages that at the start of the Industrial Revolution were about 21%. Now down to, in rural areas, 15, 16, 17%. Some urban areas, 12%. That drops much more. People are going to start dropping in the streets. We cannot continue like this. And again, the tree, planting the trees, I... I 10 years ago, could plant 300 trees in a day, plugs. They're genetically adapted trees for the area. If you know how to plant trees, as foresters plant, you can do 250 to 300 a day and have about a 90, we had about a 90 to 95% success rate. That means they 90 to 95% made it through the first year. The success rate now is zero, zero. Nothing lives through the first year, nothing. How are we to plant anything back when nothing lives because conditions have become so harsh. If climate engineering were stopped, and, and let me back up, that would be my first step. <laughs> shutting down, I, I meant to have that as a part of industrial, shutting down industrialized society in its current state and, and only what was absolutely essential could be continued. You know, this, pers this life being about a personal pursuit of material wealth is an incredibly selfish way to live. We're a part of a very complex web of life and perhaps meant to contemplate that, not to rape, loot, plunder, and pillage it until there's nothing left. That's not what life's about. Not for me. But if we shut down climate engineering, back to the trees that don't grow through the first year, 
and the hydrological cycle was allowed to resume on its own, it is very likely that many areas would again be functional enough for trees to begin growing. And if we could get that foothold and start planting trees, and, and the importance of that cannot be overstated. You can't live on a planet that resembles Venus. And that's the track we're on, Venus syndrome. And, and again, that's not a metaphor. That's a science scenario, all things being equal. This planet would only be, or Venus, let me change the equation. All things being equal, Venus would only be 20 degrees warmer than Earth. That's not much. People think Venus is 900 degrees on the surface because it's so close to the sun. That's not true. Venus is a sister planet to Earth. 20 degrees difference, and we are already a good ways toward crossing that divide. Perhaps six or seven degrees toward that divide. Venus is 900 degrees on the surface because it underwent a runaway greenhouse scenario. Exactly what we're undergoing right now. Exactly. And, and back to the statistical odds, too for your listeners to understand, because this has been done. The statistical odds of the changes happening on our planet not being anthropogenic or human-caused, zero. It's one over 100,000, zero. That's a statistical zero. And the bottom line is, we, if we want to change this equation, we all must become a part of the equation, effectively and efficiently and immediately, all of us. And for those who feel unable to communicate such a message, the less you say, the better. When you're trying to convey this issue to others, the more you go on and on about facts and figures that you're maybe not familiar enough to go on with, and you put people, you put their defenses up, they're not going to listen. Passing on credible data, visual data, compelling data, that's what's effective. So we try to make, again, that data available uh, in, in free link form or material form, and we try to make people feel like they're armed, that they have what they need to actually wake others up. And that's very empowering. And I, and I would argue this, for those who say it's futile, it's pointless, it's too far gone, one, we can't know that. There are variables in this equation. Some of them may be in our favor. And two, we should want to do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. Period. That should be our motive. Not because we're guaranteed a specific result, but because it's the right thing to do. And I would argue this as well, that for every single individual we wake up, for every single individual that any of us had part in expanding their field of vision, their level of consciousness, doesn't that matter by itself? I would ask you both, for all of you, does that matter by itself? Now, Dane, I just wanted to go back to... Um now, Scottish Sovereign is a staunch supporter that mankind is not responsible for global warming, period, and a story. The last question they wanted to ask you was, can uh, the guest tell us who started the whole global warming climate change? First, I would have to respond with, um, there should be data to back up such a statement. And aside from I don't like Al Gore either. Al Gore is a hypocrite, certainly. But the notion that we could do what we've done to the planet and not have a negative result, I would argue is a very, I don't want to be offensive, but it is, is it not an arrogant notion that we could loot, plunder, pillage, burn, cut down, poison, and nothing, there's no repercussion from that. Doesn't even, doesn't even biblical text say, as you sow to the wind, you'll reap the whirlwind. You can't do what we've done. There's a cause and effect. Of course. And again, this is not a carbon credits or a sham. I agree. Many of the environmental groups are unbelievably hypocritical. But we have to start with that. And in that narrative, that there's no global warming, paradoxically, that's exactly what the climate engineers and the power structure want the public to recite. That is exactly what they want. That's why they engineer snowstorms over the pyramids, United Arab Emirates, because they want people to be divided and confused as to the true state of the climate, and they want to cover the tracks of the climate engineers, and that's what that narrative, that's exactly what it does. So 
again, we have to we have to abandon ideology, preconception, and bias. We have to face reality. And, and let me let me finish with this, and maybe the individuals listening will understand this. We can't. There can be no legitimate discussion about the state of the climate. I don't think anybody can argue with this. So let's stand on this. You can't rationally argue with this. No one can. There can't be a legitimate discussion about the state of the climate unless we first and foremost discuss climate engineering. And by the way, even if we pretended that no other form of human activity had any effect on the climate, that somehow the climate knew the difference between a particle from the back of a jet aircraft and a smokestack and, and that one was harmful and the other one wasn't, the climate doesn't know the difference. But even if we pretended that only climate engineering was harming the planet and warming it, that's still human activity. It's not just climate engineering, but even if we pretended it was, that's human activity. It's not natural. It affects the energy balance of the planet. And let me clarify that one. Anything, everything that affects the energy balance of the planet affects the temperature of the planet. We're able to live here because we have a blanket of greenhouse gases. These gases don't just float out into space somewhere. We live in a fishbowl. If you thicken that blanket, it's going to get warmer, whether that's climate engineering, which is making the warming, warming worse, by the way, not better, short-term, highly toxic cool-downs at the cost of worse and warming. But if we stick to mantras, whatever side of the fence a person chooses to believe in, this is not arguable. There can be no, no legitimate discussion about the climate or the state of the climate without discussing climate engineering first and foremost, and there can be no legitimate discussion about climate engineering without including chemical ice nucleation, the weather modification, and the engineered cooldowns it creates. Those are inarguable mantras that we should all stick to if we have any, any desire to unite the tribes and successfully expose the whole climate engineering. Anybody else got a question? Uh, I believe what, how much time we got, uh, Russ? Uh, we've got about five and a half minutes. You have any questions you want to ask, Dane? Because you've been kind of quiet today. <laughs> well, you know, certainly this is this is sobering work. I'm at this 80 hours a week. This is all I do. It's my life's a blur. It's like a treadmill that you can't get off of, and you know, sometimes you tire and collapse, and you're hanging on the bar, your feet dragging on the belt. You know, but it it has to be done. It has to be done, and. Uh, and so, again, on the severity of what's unfolding and on the regard to the connection of climate engineering to the epidemic wildfires that are occurring, I hope to have a full 15-minute video report with lots and lots of data and images in that report by, I hope, by Friday, if not Friday, first of the week. But that report, perhaps more than any other report that we've done over the last over the decade our sites existed, should carry more weight in regard to the, uh, the gravity of what climate engineering is doing to the planet and the objectives of the climate engineers. And um, I want to state this too, so your listeners understand that what's unfolding is a very non-linear equation. Non-linear. It's happening at a pace that can scarcely be comprehended. So that's something people should keep in mind. They've been trained to look backward and think if it took 200 plus years for things to get this bad, it's going to take another couple <coughs> of years before it to get twice as bad. That's not the case. That is not the case. We are in free fall from the 100th story. We're passing the second story right now. Sidewalk's the next stop. We better learn how to fly fast or we're done. If you guys have any more, any more questions, I'd be happy to try to answer. What I encourage people to get, go to geoengineeringwatch.org. There's upper left. There's activist instructions, things you can do from your own home computer. It doesn't cost you anything. Um, there's there's other options there depending on what you want to do, but there's a lot of direction there. And all our links, by the way, many people don't realize the blue highlighted phrases in our links are hyperlinks. You just click on them and they open, and you have a lot more data. You have verification of what's being said. You, it leads 
And then in those articles, there's more hyperlinks. So any blue highlighted phrase is a hyperlink in our articles. A lot of people still don't realize that. because we give activist instructions and so forth in every article we do. So um, instructions are there. We all need to start spot fires of awareness where we're at and fan those flames, ask others to help until we have enough. I hate to use spot fires as a, as a metaphor right now with everything going on, but um, we need to create a bonfire of awareness big enough that it can't be put out. Does that make sense, Max? It does. Listen, Dane, uh, we, on, we only got about a minute and a half before we got off the air. Uh, were you willing to come again very soon? Um, you know, uh, it'll depend on my schedule, Max. I'll have okay. to, uh, have we'll to figure out what I can. I, I, I'll try to, you know, you can reach me on email. Okay. Uh, there's one uh, person I think you might be interested in having on that I might be able to arrange. Uh, but uh, right now i got fires closing in on uh, two sides. Okay. And we have quite a, a quite a – array of challenges in front of us here but uh i'll do my best depending on how things unfold. in the meantime i encourage your listeners to keep an eye on the horizon don't believe anything i said look at the actual fisheries collapse crop collapse okay polar situation a film called chasing ice if your listeners that haven't seen that search it online you can watch it for about three dollars okay uh dane i got 60 seconds i have to uh you bet okay my website is max21d.com uh and this is Wolf Spirit Radio. I want to thank uh, Dane Wigginton for coming on the on the show, and I want to thank Jennifer for acquiring this to happen. Uh, Dane, please uh, uh, say your website really quickly. Geoengineeringwatch.org. Okay, thank you. Uh, try to get that other person you're talking about. We'll work on that. Okay, I really appreciate everything you've done for the humanity, and I want to thank everyone. Mm-hmm. For being on the Max Steel Show, we'll see you next week. Thank you. Boy, that was quick. He left already. <laughs>